John chapter 19 at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Again, we pray God's blessing on the reading of his word. Chapter 19, and at verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So when Jesus received the sour wine or the vinegar, he said, It is finished. It is finished. These are the uh, second last words that Jesus spoke on the cross. Uh, three very famous words in the English language. Just one word in the Greek language. Uh, but a very precious word. Once we come to understand what this word means in the Greek or what these words mean in the English. And I'd like with uh, God's help just to look at this expression, this exclamation, a uh, triumphant one. We'll look at it this morning and tonight as the Lord enables us. Now, as I said, in the Greek language, as the Lord spoke it, it was uh, only one word, but a very difficult word to say. Difficult to say on the physical level. The previous utterance that the Lord had made had been misunderstood. When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The first two words, my God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, the people misunderstood and thought that he was calling Elijah, calling on Elijah to return from heaven and to be his deliverer. Now, the people didn't think that because uh, they didn't know the Hebrew language. The reason they thought it was because of how indistinct the Lord's voice was when he spoke those words. We've always got to remember that he is severely dehydrated. And according to himself in his prayer, in Psalm 22, his tongue was cleaving fast to his jaw. His tongue would have swollen to twice its size, and it was difficult for him to actually articulate the words that he wanted to speak. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Look, he is calling for Elijah. But he was not, of course. He was calling upon his God. The psalm tells us that when they saw that his thirst was great, they offered him vinegar to drink. Now, sad to say, that was not really meant to alleviate the Lord's distress. Uh, there was nothing coming from anywhere to alleviate the Lord's distress in that sense. Um, no one was showing him any kindness. And the vinegar was just to add to his woes. I mean, what use is vinegar to someone dying of dehydration and pain in crucifixion. But although they offered him the vinegar, surprisingly, he took it, even though it was meant to be for his shame. Well, I suppose he embraced his shame anyway. 
you'll remember that he had been offered an anesthetic at the beginning of the crucifixion. Uh, he didn't take that. The reason that he didn't take it was because it hadn't been prescribed for him. It hadn't been prescribed for him by his heavenly father, and therefore he did not take it, but he took the vinegar. Now, the only reason he took it was actually to enable him to speak more distinctly, because the last two words were words that he wanted the whole world to hear. And these words were the words of our text, it is finished, and then almost immediately after that, he looks upward, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. And with that, he dismisses his spirit into the hands of his gracious Father. So after he receives the vinegar, just to moisten his lips and his tongue, there is a supreme effort of will and spirit on his part, so that he actually raises his head which is a very unusual thing for someone in that kind of weakness and during that kind of pain in a crucifixion to do. But he must raise his head because he's going out of this world in triumph, not as someone defeated, but as someone who is defeating and victorious. So he lifts his head and with a strength of voice that really astonishes everybody, he proclaims, it is finished. Most of you, or some of you anyway, will know that these words are actually a quotation. Christ is quoting. And he's quoting, as he does so often, from the book of Psalms. In fact, the previous utterance on the cross was also a quotation from the book of Psalms. In fact, a quotation from the same psalm. Psalm 22, which we sing so often, and which I hope we appreciate. Uh, deeply at a spiritual level. It's interesting that the Lord quotes the opening cry of that psalm, and he quotes the closing cry of the psalm. The opening cry of Psalm 22 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the closing cry of the psalm is just this, It is finished. A cry of dereliction at the beginning and a cry of triumph at the end. I'm sure I've pointed out before that I think it's more than likely that our Lord went through the whole psalm, at least mentally, on the cross. It is, after all, his own prayer. Uh, amazingly, he wrote this psalm and sent it by the Spirit to be written by David long before he came into this world. As he grew up as a child, he read it and knew that it would be a prayer that he would offer in the hour of his extremity. And when the time came, he took that psalm that he had so often sung and made it his own personal prayer, which it was always designed to be. So I've no doubt that by quoting the beginning and quoting the end, uh, cry of dereliction and a cry of triumph, the Lord is effectively going through the whole psalm, clause by clause, thought by thought, petition by petition, until he reaches the end. A reminder to us that he, like ourselves, was comforted by the psalms. They were his meat and his drink, and if they comforted him, then how much more should they comfort ourselves too? Now, as I said, these are three words in the English language, one word in the Greek, a very precious word, and I want to unpack it with you, uh, with God's help. And let me begin by saying three things about it. First of all, something about the meaning of the word finished. Now, that's a simple enough word. Um, but strictly speaking, the idea behind this word in the Greek is not the idea of something being over but of something being complete. Now, there's a subtle distinction in thought there. Not so much something being over, but something being complete. In other words, it's not a, an event or a thing that has passed, but a task that has been accomplished. 
And one thing that actually brings that very much to light is um, another verse here, verse 28. If you read that, we're looking at verse 30, but if you just go back to verse 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now it's that expression, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. That's actually the same word as the word that we find in verse 30, where he says, it is finished. Accomplished. It's translated accomplished there. It's translated finished here. That's reminding us or highlighting for us that when Jesus says that something is finished, he's actually saying it's accomplished. Something is not just over on the cross, but something has been done. That's the point. A task of some kind, a work of some kind, has now been accomplished. Then again, there's something about the scope of the words. In the text, it sounds as though it's just one thing that has been accomplished or finished. It is finished. But again, if you just take that back to verse 23, this singular it becomes a plural, all things. Verse 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, says, I thirst. He gets the vinegar and then says, it is finished. So clearly this singular it, whatever it is, includes many, many things. It's a more involved and complex set of things that have been accomplished on the cross. So in other words, we don't just ask of this text what has been accomplished, we ask what things have been accomplished. What things have been finished? And uh, God willing, tonight we'll see what most of these things were. The third thing I want us to notice something about the agent of the accomplishment. Who's doing the accomplishing? Now, you would say that the verse isn't highlighting that. In fact, the verse is passive. It is finished. Even when you use the word accomplished, it's still passive. It is accomplished. Or even all things are accomplished. But there's an obvious question. By whom? Who's done it? Who did the accomplishing? And that's the emphasis in the psalm. One reason why it's important to remember that this text is a quotation is because you always go back to where the Lord is quoting from. If you want to know what the Lord means and what the Lord is thinking, just go back to the psalm that he's quoting. Now, Psalm 22, of course, famously begins with our Lord's sufferings on the cross. Then halfway through the psalm, he begins to see the light. In other words, the darkness begins to be dispelled, even on the cross itself, as the light begins to come in. And he begins again to taste of the joy that is set before him. Now, he was not able to participate of that under the three-hour period of darkness and his father's wrath. But as that begins to pass, he begins again to taste the joy that is set before him. And that will culminate when the vast congregation of the redeemed are actually drawn to the Lord himself. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven: All the ends of the world and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. A posterity shall serve him. One of the things being hurled at him on the cross is that he had no children. No children. Who shall declare his generation? As Isaiah says it. The most disgraceful thing for a king is to die without seed. You even see that in the uh, monarchies of Europe, the obsession with having a seed, or a male seed particularly. But this king, or this man who claimed to be king, is dying childless. 
who shall declare his generation? But the psalm actually says that a posterity shall actually serve him, even if his hands and feet are pierced. And in the next generation, they will come and they will declare his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Notice that the righteousness of this king will be declared by one generation to another. They will declare his righteousness to a people unborn that he has finished it. That he has done this, that he has finished it. The Greek translation of Psalm 22 is the same Greek word that we have in here, tetelestai, finished. So what's happening here is that the whole church in successive generations are saying, he finished it. I'll pass that on to my children. I pray that my children will pass that on to their children, that he, that man there, has finished it. Now, when the Lord finishes his recitation of the prayer, or at least going through it in his mind, he comes to this last sentence. Yes, they'll declare my righteousness to generations yet unborn, that I have done it. And therefore, he says, it is finished. Or, in context, I finished it. I've done it. I have accomplished it. So the agent of the accomplishment is Christ. So let me just sum that up. When Christ says it is finished here, he is effectively declaring that he has himself, alone, personally, accomplished several things as he now deliberately and voluntarily lays down his life. These things that he's accomplished himself, alone, personally, he describes as a singular body of things. I have accomplished it. So then, our question is not simply, what have you finished, but what have you accomplished? And with that in mind, let's begin, God willing, to unpack our text. What have you accomplished for us? What has our Savior accomplished? Now, let me begin by saying, first of all, that taken as a whole, our Savior accomplished his life, his own life. And that's his life viewed as a life with a purpose and a goal, which every life should have. There's something sadly Uh, tragically and solemnly lacking about a life that doesn't have a purpose and a goal. But for some people, life is like that. They just meander their way through life, through childhood, through youth, through adulthood, and eventually to old age. There's no real value attached to their life, and their increasing sense of disillusionment is something that they try and make up for by a succession of experiences which have to be more heady than the previous ones in order to get them something. Very often these are out-of-body experiences and people use drugs to reach these things. But eventually this kind of life just peters out and the people who live it just see it through. Sadly, sometimes they bring it to a premature end. Life with no goal, life with no purpose, it's very often idea an idea people have when they don't believe in God anyway. And, and to be quite honest, it's difficult to avoid it, really. Because without God, there is no meaning and purpose. You can't deny that. The only thing that does give meaning and purpose to life is the existence of God. Um, whatever else may be true about life, it has no meaning and purpose if there is no God. Absolutely not. Things like meaning and purpose are ideas that you evacuate out of life if there is no God. So some people have no goal or purpose. Now, I'm sure most of you are not like that. I would assume that most of you have at least some kind of goal in life. Again, sometimes people's goals are very idealistic and unattainable. It's quite common for Disney to tell children that you can be whoever and whatever you want to be. There's a succession of films animations usually that 
tell children that they can be whoever they want to be. The fruits of that are now all too evident. People want to be everything they're not. They want to change their identity. They want to change their bodies. They want to change their sex, their gender, everything. Reminds me of what Woody Allen, the film director, was once quoted as saying. He was asked, uh, as he was entering old age, if he had any regret in life. And he said, my only regret is that I wasn't somebody else. It's quite a major regret to have. But that's the kind of mindset that is being cultivated and encouraged. You can be anybody or anything that you want to be. There is a man famously who is in the process of changing himself physically to look like a reptile because he wants to be identified as a reptile. He's had his ears taken off, he's had his tongue split and so on. He wants to be a reptile. Well, you might think that's ridiculous. But it's ridiculous and more for boys to want to be girls and girls to want to be boys. I'll, I'll never forget listening to a lady who was counselling a a young girl who was going to spend tens of thousands of dollars on getting her body changed to become a man because she couldn't be happy until she was a man. She felt that she was really a man. The lady who was speaking to her said, do you not think it might be easier to try to change your mind rather than change your body? Seems quite obvious to us that that's where the problem really lies. But no, it's this sense of being who and what you want to be, irrespective of how God made you. That's encouraged. Be anything you want to be. For other people, their goal in life isn't idealistic or unattainable. In fact, their goals in life are good and praiseworthy. They might involve things like just having a stable home, a good and prosperous marriage, a family if God so wills it and blesses you to have it, and to be a help and a strength in your community, and particularly in the church. For some people, it doesn't reach to church, it just reaches to community. So they, they just want to be stable like that, and to have these things, job, family, and so on. The problem with that is that for these people, their, their goal or their purpose in life rises no higher than that. So while these things may in themselves be good things, well, it's not high enough. So they very often evaluate their life by the extent to which they've achieved that. So if their marriage is stable and it lasts, and if their family do well and get good jobs, then they are relatively content. Because jobs and status matter. Status matters. Of course, sad to say, these things collapse in spite of some people's best efforts. The family disintegrates. The finance disappears. And at the end of that, there is the feeling again, what was that all about? What was that all about? What was my marriage about? What, what was having children about or raising a family about? It's gone. It's disintegrated in front of my eyes. The problem with that is that the goal and purpose of your life wasn't high enough. Wasn't high enough. Remember again, the first question of the Catechism, we were just at it two or three weeks ago, keeps popping up. What is man's chief end? Chief end. What is your chief purpose in living? It's not home, family. It's not marriage. It's not work. Chief end? Your chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is your primary end. And once you begin to work for that end, everything else takes its rightful place. If you don't get that right, you get nothing right. Nothing at all. If you get that right, everything else has a way of working, in one way or another, even when it appears to fall apart. If your ultimate goal is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then you will live for doing God's will. 
you will live for pleasing him, for serving him. You know him as your Lord and maker and as the lover of your soul and your whole life will revolve around doing his will for you. Doing his will for you. And everything that you accomplish will be for him. You won't live for recognition and status. These are things that the world bestows. You won't care about that. Rather, you'll be living for God. Now, I want you to notice that this obsession, and I call it obsession in the best sense of the term, is something that characterized the life of Christ from its beginning. Call it a focus, a goal, a purpose. Last week, we saw Christ as the grain of wheat falling into the ground and dying. We saw him coming into this world. And in Psalm 40, he speaks as he comes into this world, as he steps, as it were, out of heaven, coming into this earth, saying, To do thy will, I take delight. It is written of me in the volume of the book. Now, I don't know whether by book he is referring to God's eternal counsel, uh, God's eternal decree that he should come into the world, or is he referring to the scripture that prophesied that he would come into the world? Either way, it doesn't matter, because the scripture itself rests on God's eternal decree. But it is written in both the book of the eternal decree and in the book of scripture that I come into this world to do thy will and to do it I take delight. So that is his motivating purpose from the start. That's why you find him uh, at the threshold of adulthood, at 12 years of age, when he is just going his own way, you find him in the temple discussing matters of God's word and God's house with the doctors in the temple. Of course, his mother rebukes him. Your father and I have sought you sorrowing. He responds, my father, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? It's exactly the same kind of statement. His will is what's before me at all times. That is what I am carrying out. At the close of his life, when he's about to finish his life, he says this, that I must do the will of him who sent me while it is yet day. And when he's about to take the cup in Gethsemane, which initiates the last part of his life, the passive part <laughs> in which he's active, the part of suffering and pain, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. That's his motivation from beginning to end. And that is the secret of accomplishing a life. Rather than a life that simply peters out and expires. Now, for most of us, doing the will of God might not be all that spectacular. Sometimes, as Thomas Gray says in the Elegy in the country churchyard. It is something that we read in the annals of the poor. He sees row after row of people um, in the churchyard, and he describes them as lying there in their narrow cells, of course not rising again, not of course until the day of the resurrection. For some of us, doing the will of God might just be uh, living as a husband or a wife and being God willing, a father or a mother, and helping others in our family or in the community or in the church. And you say, well, that's, that's setting the bar low for life, is it? Is that not how the vast bulk of people have always lived? As Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, let everyone aspire to do their work quietly and to mind their own business. Again, as Thomas Gray said, when he thought of those poor people whose names were not memorialized, they had no stones on their tombs, he said, let not ambition mock their useful toil, their humble joys, and their obscure destiny. Because he knows what they lived for, and who they lived for, and that made life worth living. It doesn't really matter what status the world gives you. If you can be a good mother, 
That matters a lot to God. It doesn't matter who notices that. It really does not matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because when the roll call is called in heaven, invariably you will find what we have found on the earth, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You will find ecclesiastics and churchmen cast into the depths of hell, and you will find poor Christians who people hardly noticed raised to positions of glory and honor because they served the Lord in their respective callings. Even just as a husband or a wife or a father or a mother. Whatever it be. If that is your goal in life, you won't just live life, but you'll accomplish it. And you'll die like the Savior. It's a good thing to be able to die like that. The Apostle Paul died like that too. Uh, there's, there's one way in which you could look at himself dying in a prison cell and say, well, what was that about Paul? He's conscious as he's dying in prison that most of the teachers overseeing the Asian churches are rejecting himself and his own ministry. Very conscious of that. He's conscious that he's dying in his 60s. He's going to die uh, under a Roman sword. He's cold. He's very hungry. He's isolated. And yet he can say that I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day. And not to me only but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Who have loved the thought of his appearing and love the thought of his manifestation. Not those who have achieved this or that. Those who have loved that. They will receive that crown of righteousness. Now I'm conscious that you can look back. Let's say you're not a Christian here today. And you're now starting to get fairly advanced in age. It's possible for you to look back with a kind of wistfulness and regret and say to yourself, well, you know, I, I haven't either been or done what I thought I would be or done what I thought I would have accomplished. There is a sense of unfulfillment in your life. And of course, the nearer you get to the end of your life, there's the sense that that's, ir that's something irretrievable. Uh, Vive, I have lived. It's over. It's gone. Now, if I wasn't a Christian or a believer in God, and if there was no God, there's not much I could say to you. I could try and point up some, some things you might have done in life, but doubtless you'll just brush them off and say, well, that's not up to much. But the fact that I am a Christian and that I am a minister of the word of God and that I am standing here as an ambassador of God addressing you means that it's very, very different from that. As I've said so often before, the marvel of Christianity is that it is in the business of making things new and retrieving what seems irretrievable and lost. The fact is that suppose you're entering your seventh decade, let's say that, God can suddenly fill your life to overflowing. And not only can he fill your life to overflowing with a sense of meaning and purpose, he can actually start to recall the past that you lived in such a way as to make it bear fruit in your life right now. We referred to it some months ago from the famous text in Joel that he will restore to you, or as God says, he says it personally, I will restore to you the years which the locust has eaten. How can you get a restoration of something consumed? I mean, it doesn't seem to make sense. That harvest has gone, has been, can't be recalled, can't come back. Ah, but God has his way of doing it. I will restore to you the years which the locust has eaten. And, of course, that begins by turning 
to the Lord Jesus Christ and embracing him by faith. The moment he becomes the purpose for living, the reason for living, knowing, loving, and serving God, it begins to redeem everything else. Even things that seem to have fallen and fractured away, relationships that have broken, they can start to fix because you're fixing them from your end. You start to fix them in prayer. You start to fix them at the throne of grace. And even disastrous things that took place, God has a way of redeeming them, saying, well, this was there, but let me now use it like this in your life, like this for the benefit of someone else, like this. Most painful and difficult things. I was watching just a little bit of a, a video of Helen Rosevear, who was a, a wonderful Christian missionary in Congo, as it was then in the 50s and the 60s. And after serving God in very difficult circumstances for, for many, many years, there was the famous Congo uprising of the early 60s. She was taken, beaten, constantly raped in hugely difficult situations. And she often, well, she doesn't say that, that I would ask why she says, but, but the Lord made plain to me that, that there was a purpose in this, even though I didn't know it. And years afterwards, she began to find, no, well, not, not even years, but fairly soon afterwards, she began to find an audience with people who hadn't listened to her before because of the pain and the grief that she went through. Um, so years of, of nothing, years of confinement, years of prison, when you might be tempted to say, well, well, what's the point of this? It has a point because God is in it, and God is doing something with it, and God always does something with things, so that whatever the ruin and the wastage of the past, God can take and use in the present. N in the present, and nothing else can do that. Nothing else can rescue and restore. N nothing can give you hope when everything around you says that it's actually hopeless, except this. It's not too late to believe. It's not too late to have God in your life. With the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, he was in a different position. There was never a waking moment when this was not his goal and his purpose. So he can look back on a life laid down and said that, I've lived this life. I've lived it for a purpose, with an intention, and I lay down my life having done that, because always... To do thy will was my delight. So the whole of his life is an accomplishment. But now we want to break that down and ask, well, in what ways and in what respects was Christ's life an accomplishment? Let's leave that God willing to this evening. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our life is a vapor that appears uh, for a moment and then vanishes away. And uh, we realize that it is of no profit to gain a whole world and uh, to lose our own souls. And there is nothing to be pitied so much as a human life made in the image of God, living carelessly and godlessly in this present world, without a sense of purpose, meaning, or destiny. How blessed are those in here today who can say that the Lord has filled their hearts and given them a reason to live and to love and to be, and the knowledge within them that the Lord has prepared an everlasting home where they will know you as their Father in heaven. Such gifts and blessings are only found in one way and through one channel. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And whatever our emptiness 
an emptiness in our past and an emptiness in our present. O Lord, may we speedily bring that to an end by finding the one who is well worthy of finding, a pearl of great price for whom it is worth selling everything to obtain. We pray these things in his name, for his sake. Amen. Our last singing is in Psalm 49, at verse 16. The whole psalm is so worthy of meditation, really. It's the emptiness of a life that appears full. In verse 6, whoever they be, that in their wealth their confidence do pitch and boast themselves because they have become exceeding rich, yet none of these his brother can redeem by any way, nor can he unto God for him sufficient ransom pay. In verse 9, that still he should forever live and not corruption see, because everyone dies. Verse 11, their inward thought is that their house and dwelling places shall stand through all ages. You see people like that, and they're working on their houses, as though, as though the house is going to last forever. They call their lands by their own names, trying to immortalize themselves. But yet in honor shall not man abide continually, but passing from here may be compared to the beasts that die. In verse 14, they are laid in the grave like sheep. And death will devour them. doesn't matter how powerful they were. And in the morning, that's in the resurrection morning, upright men shall have power over them. They'll discover then to whom the earth really belongs. So in verse 16, Be thou not then afraid when one enriched thou deceit, because very often when people grew in wealth, they grew in power. Or when the glory of his house advanced is on high. For he shall carry nothing hence. Nothing when death his days doth end, nor shall his glory after him into the grave descend. It doesn't matter what pomp and grandeur you have, you can't take any of it into the grave. Although he his own soul did bless, whilst he on earth did live, and when thou to thyself dost well, men will they praises give. It's amazing how people will uh, give you praise when you seem to do well, but... What does it all matter? Because he to his father's race shall go, they never shall see light. Man honored, wanting, remember that's an old word for lacking, so man that receives honor while he is lacking knowledge is like the beasts that perish quite. What is our chief end? These last four stanzas uh, to the tune Evan standing to sing. I'm not then afraid when one enriched thy dusty, nor when the glory of his eyes advanced is on high, for he shall come. His days doth end, nor shall his glory after him into the grave descend. Although he his own soul did bless, whilst he on earth did live. standing to receive God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.